All right. Thank you, Vadim. So thus far in the conference, you've mostly heard about using today's quantum computers, but this talk's mostly going to be about applications of tomorrow's quantum computers. So as you may know, at Google, we are building an air-corrected quantum computer. It may look something like this. What we have in mind is a device with about 0.1% air rates and about a million physical qubits that can execute the surface code. Needless to say, this is going to be a challenging and expensive endeavor, which begs the question, why? Why are we doing this? And for many scientists, part of the answer is at least that quantum computers are really interesting and frankly, very cool. But if you look at the scale of investment that Google and frankly, the world is making in these technologies at this point, it's clear there's hope for more than that. In particular, people are hoping that these devices are going to actually solve important and otherwise intractable problems in practice. So to what extent is this really the case? Well, we do know that there are some use cases for a device like this with a million physical qubits, but perhaps there are fewer clearly articulated applications than we would hope. So this talk is about research into the resources required for promising applications. And I hope that we perhaps inspire more researchers to study practical applications of what a platform like this could actually achieve. So air correction is you know, the dream of quantum computing, but it is very expensive. With 0.1% error rate gates, most algorithms are gonna require about 1,000 physical qubits per logical qubit. Furthermore, certain gates that are necessary for universality, like T gates or Toffley gates, are very slow and will require hundreds of logical qubits. So this translates to a huge constant factor slowdown in the space time required for quantum computation versus a classical computation. To put that into context, to execute a classical NAND gate using CMOS takes a few transistors in less than a nanosecond. So maybe about 10 to the minus nine transistor seconds of space time. Uh, to do sort of the quantum equivalent, which is a Toffoli gate, that's sort of like a quantum NAND gate, uh, in the surface code, our best constructions still require more than 10 qubit seconds. These units are a little bit different, but you know, this is roughly a 10 order of magnitude separation. And I would argue that that big constant factor slowdown is very problematic for certain applications of quantum computing that only realize a more modest speed up. So for example, uses of amplitude amplification to accelerate Monte Carlo applications in finance or uses of Grover's algorithm to speed up uh, combinatorial optimization, things like this. So I wanna say a little bit more about that. Uh, just imagine that we have a classical algorithm with a scaling that goes as some constant C times an abstraction of the problem size we'll call M. M might be the size of the database in a search problem. It might be the number of trajectories in a Monte Carlo simulation, something like that. And then we have a quantum algorithm that's scaling quadratically better, but with a much bigger constant in front of it. Uh, so like what we just talked about. You know, just based on this, I can draw this sort of cartoon that is showing a plot of the space-time volume required versus the problem size for quantum and classical. And you know, just because the quantum algorithm starts out so much slower, the quantum advantage isn't going to occur until very, very, very large problem sizes. You know, with the numbers we've talked about so far, maybe problem sizes on the order of 10 to the 20. Now, for exponential speedups, this constant factor is going to be easily overcome, so it's not really such a problem. Uh, but for quadratic speedups, it's going to be a, an issue. And if you find this cartoon maybe a bit too hand wavy for you, I'd refer you to this uh, paper we published in PRX Quantum last year, which is about compi uh, com compiling uh, heuristic algorithms for combinatorial optimization to the surface code, and actually working out what some of those constant factors are. And then a little bit more recently than that, we put out another PRX Quantum paper, which was really a perspective piece, making a more complete version of this argument. Uh, essentially against the notion that quadratic speedups would enable quantum advantage on uh, small error corrected devices, uh, at least ones with a million physical qubits and, and possibly never. Uh, so unfortunately, we find that this conclusion likely persists even if we were to speed up the implementation of fault tolerance by orders of magnitude. Uh, though I will say on a positive note, the analysis does become significantly more encouraging for slightly higher order polynomial speedups like a quartic speedup. So if quadratic speedups aren't promising, what is an application that is seemingly useful and would have a much larger speedup, ideally an exponential speedup? And the answer that I'd like to talk about today is, of course, quantum simulation. 
So when I talk about quantum simulation, I like to have in mind sort of a spectrum of applications. Where on one side of the spectrum, you have applications where it's uh, frankly rather easy to achieve a quantum advantage, but you know it's perhaps not that useful of an application yet. And on the other side, you have some you know potentially very useful things that are harder to execute. So on the left side, we have things like simulating you know fast scrambling or um, you know ergodic quantum many body states, OTOX. They may have some applications to you know black hole physics or things like this, and it looks very much like these beyond classical um, experiments we've already executed on NISC devices. And some members of our own team, uh, Craig Gidney, uh, estimated that to reproduce an experiment like that within fault tolerance with the platform we have in mind would take maybe 25,000 physical qubits, which is great. It's not a lot of qubits, but maybe isn't so useful. A little bit further down on this spectrum, you could think about simulating um, quantum spin models or uh, other sorts of lattice models, which are sort of coarse-grained models of quantum magnetism. They're you know, qualitatively interesting, but they also may have some practical applications and technologies. For example, uh, NMR spectra arise from you know, just sort of the nuclear spins interacting, uh, which would probably be a fairly simple quantum simulation to carry out, but the dynamics would still be hard classically. People have looked into simulating models like this, and it looks like a couple hundred thousand physical qubits would probably survive. A little further down on this spectrum is the simulation of molecules and materials. And here I have a pixelated picture of a molecule and a crystal because with maybe a couple hundred thousand to a million physical qubits, you could start to perform these simulations, but you may have limited resolution. In contrast, if you have you know, a few million physical qubits, you can probably perform very accurate simulations of molecules and materials. Even further down, you could think about doing more realistic models of physics, like from quantum field theory, which may have applications in high energy physics. And that's very interesting, and there has been work on this, but no work thus far has really figured out the constant factors required to implement such simulations for specific problems in an error correcting code. And so I have question marks here for the cost. And in this talk, I'm gonna focus more on talking about these applications and simulating molecules and materials. So to say a bit more about that, um, you know, molecules are basically just nuclei and electrons which are interacting with each other. They have kinetic energy. They're interacting according to the Coulomb operator. But in quantum chemistry, we often are able to assume that the, the nuclei are essentially classical objects and we can fix their position. We just focus on looking at the electronic wave function, which predicts chemical bonding and features such as that. So once we fix these nuclei, it becomes possible to perform the simulation of the electrons in a very fancy basis of so-called molecular orbitals, which are obtained from mean field solutions to the electron physics. Now, using these fancy basis functions reduces the number of qubits required, but it does increase the algorithmic complexity. So when people first started looking at what it would take to you know, realistically simulate uh, molecules using these algorithms, there were these estimates dating back to 2014 suggesting you know 10 to the 20 gates might be required it would scales end to the 10. on our platform those sort of estimates would probably correspond to hundreds of millions of physical qubits but the community continued to refine these algorithms and in 2017 there was a first paper giving very specific estimates for how many gates would be required to simulate a specific interesting molecule which i've drawn here it's uh, the famoco molecule which is important for fertilizer production and nitrogen fixation um, and uh, this 2017 work from the Microsoft group, um, it would probably require about 20 million physical qubits on our platform, which is, you know, it's not science fiction, but it's, it's more than we would hope for. Um, so around that time, our own team was thinking about, all right, well, what, what could we do that might be easier to achieve with about a million physical qubits? And one answer we came up with working in collaboration with Garnet Chan's group at Caltech was that if we simplify the basis functions and use, say, a plane wave basis, we're able to execute the algorithms with much improved scaling, but we sort of lose some resolution in the simulations, at least if we use the same number of basis functions that we would with molecular orbitals. Yet, this would enable us to um, simulate especially some interesting models of materials, which are perhaps a bit coarse-grained, with a few hundred thousand to about a million physical qubits. So that's interesting, but what I really want to talk about more is some even more recent work that uh, we published in PRX Quantum just a couple weeks ago in collaboration with Junho Lee and Dominic Berry, 
where we're able to use tensor factorizations to essentially compress the information needed to specify the Hamiltonian in a way that allows us to bring the scaling down to the same scaling you have with the plane waves, but with the same resolution you have with the molecular or orbitals. And as a result of that, we could simulate a molecule like FAMOCO using just about 10 to the 10 gates in about 2 million physical qubits, which is now looking quite practical. So to say just a little bit about how this works, the challenge of simulating in the molecular orbital basis is that the Coulomb operator becomes quite complicated. It tends to have n to the four terms. Now, when you use a simple basis functions like plane waves as a representation where the Coulomb operator is diagonal, it has only n squared terms, but you'd need n to be very, very large to have the same resolution. So what we do in this recent work is we are able to compute a new sort of basis, which is only slightly larger than the original basis, but which also diagonalizes the Coulomb operator, although the basis is non-orthogonal. The way that this is accomplished is by performing a tensor factorization on the coefficients of the two-body operator, and then using the tensors from that factorization in order to define a projection into this larger auxiliary basis um, which, like I say, is non-orthogonal, and we then use some clever algorithmic techniques to mitigate some of the um, you know, consequences of it being non-orthogonal. So I should say that we're very excited about this work because now the scaling is very good and it's very accurate. And quite frankly, after having personally worked on this problem for seven or eight years, I think we're getting sort of a near optimal solution for this type of representation. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that this work did not happen in a vacuum. In fact, below I'm highlighting a bunch of different techniques that we sort of used in our own work. We put a lot of these pieces together in order to get the high efficiency algorithms that uh, are described there. And you know, this work comes from many different groups. I've highlighted work from our own team in blue. So we've been um, you know, working on this for a good amount of time, but it's really something that has built on itself um, through, a, through a larger community. So as excited as, as I am about uh, those results, I want to emphasize that uh, th there's another way of simulating quantum chemistry that I'm even more excited about. And to motivate this, I'll say it would be really nice if we could perform simulations in a plane wave basis because that would, you know, with high precision, because that would allow us to simulate materials. But you do need hundreds of times more plane waves than molecular orbitals to get high precision. And in second quantization, this is basically a non-starter because the number of qubits required is equal to the number of orbitals. So if you needed 50 or 100,000 plane waves, you'd need 50 or 100,000 logical qubits, which could translate to billions of physical qubits, and that's just not going to happen. Uh, however, there's a different way that you can encode the system physics, which is using first quantization. And none of the prior works doing error corrected resource estimates have looked at first quantization up to this point. But in first quantization, the number of qubits required is the number of particles times the log of the number of basis functions. Uh, so it's exponentially better scaling in terms of the number of basis functions, but algorithmically it can be very challenging uh, to do with low gate complexity. And the reason for that is because the Hamiltonians in this representation are no longer local Hamiltonians. But in 2018, we were able to describe a method which could perform simulation in this representation with a gate complexity that was scaling as n to the one third. Uh, and so that looked very promising, but it then took us about two and a half years and about 100 single spaced paper uh, pages in order to um, figure out the constant factors associated with this algorithm and actually compile it to um, you know, an error correcting code. And um, basically I'm showing a plot here from that work where what I'm plotting is the number of Toffoli gates required for one of our best algorithms is a function of the number of particles in the simulation in a simulation where we're using 300,000 plane waves. So 300,000 plane waves is a lot of plane waves. So you expect that to be very accurate. And you can see the resources required here are, are fairly modest, um, you know, at least by the standards of simulating systems of this scale. Um, there's a couple different color lines here. Those correspond to the different densities of the particles in the simulation. Most materials you'd be interested in simulating probably have are, are about the green dots there. Um, so needless to say, this sort of enables the accurate simulation of realistic solid state and material Hamiltonians for the first time, which I think really opens up an exciting new application. 
But what was really surprising was that it turned out that simulations using a few hundred thousand plane waves were often cheaper than simulations using around 100 Gaussian orbitals. And what that means is, you know, that many plane waves is probably more accurate or can be more accurate than 100 Gaussian orbitals. So this means these methods may even be um, competitive with the molecular orbital algorithms for simulating even single molecules. But the part that I'm most excited about is that um, this representation opens up the possibility of performing non uh, born oppenheimer quantum dynamics. And so what I mean by that is full simulations with both the nuclei and the electrons evolving in time. So you can't do that with molecular orbitals because the molecular orbitals derive their advantage from being centered on nuclei. However, um, you know, if the nuclei are moving, the molecular orbitals don't make sense. And furthermore, you can't do simulations in second quantization using, um, using uh, plane waves because you wouldn't have enough resolution, but you can do that in first quantization. So uh, that's enough about chemistry. I'd be remiss if I didn't quickly mention another few prominent application areas. Uh, you know, everyone is familiar with Shor's algorithm, which certainly has applications, uh, but perhaps not the ones that the world needs right now. Uh, Google has done some work on the topic. Craig Gidney from our team wrote a paper showing that breaking 2,000-bit RSA encryption would uh, require um, the tens of millions of physical qubits on our platform. Um, I think another promising area is algorithms for quantum linear algebra, like the HHL algorithm, which give an exponential speed up for solving linear systems of equations. Um, and in principle, that's really exciting, but in practice, there are a number of tricky conditions that have to be met to realize a quantum advantage there. The system of equations has to have a certain condition number. It has to have a certain structure. You have to be able to sample from the solution. Um, and so, you know, one application I think is promising is using those methods for solving differential equations. Um, but you have to be careful because if those methods can be solved by classical Monte Carlo methods, then um, you, you have an approach that scales independently of the dimension there. And so you'll probably not do better than a quadratic speed up. So you need to look for areas where you might have a Monte Carlo sign problem or something like that. Um, you know, finally, applications in machine learning are always popular and with good reason. You know, we do know that quantum circuits can sample from classically inaccessible probability distributions and machine learning is fundamentally about learning probability distributions. Um, but I think the key question to ask is sort of what properties of data or what kind of data sets really need these quantum correlations for their descriptions so that you could get a quantum advantage. And it's a difficult question that I think is still very much open. Uh, there is some work on the topic. I'd like to highlight a recent paper, for example, from um, uh, Richard Huang, uh, who is an intern with our team that was published recently in Nature Communications. Um, so I'd like to basically wrap things up by just emphasizing the importance of the following question, which is how will a modest air-corrected quantum computer impact the world? Frankly, I think our community has a responsibility to provide a more clear answer to this question. Uh, I, I think that it's also clear that we need to do better than, you know, these algorithms that are enticing because they're broadly applicable, but they give only a quadratic speed up, like these amplitude amplification, um, you know, Monte Carlo speed ups and uses of Grover's algorithms or combinatorial um, optimization heuristics that may only promise a quadratic speed up. Of course, the quantum simulation remains a very promising application area, and you know one area of quantum simulation that I think has the potential for a lot of impact on technologies is the simulation of molecules and materials, which looks very promising. Um, there's been a lot of work on second quantized algorithms for these approaches that, frankly, I think are at this point getting near optimal, uh, and we can maybe expect those to require a few hundred thousand to a few million physical qubits, but there's really also this um, relatively unexplored class of approaches in first quantization, which are now looking very practical and really open the door for simulating material systems and also performing chemical dynamics, which I think is really exciting. Uh, finally, I'll say that quantum algorithms for linear systems and machine learning, they, they seem to have very broad appeal. Everyone, you know, can think of problems in machine learning and linear algebra that apply to them. But it does appear that the best hope for a speed up there is to find instances with a very specific structure, which may limit some of the impact of those algorithms. Nonetheless, we'll still keep searching. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank uh, really the whole quantum AI team, but especially you want to Nicholas Rubin, Craig Gidney, Jared McLean, William Huggins, Michael Newman, and Sergio Boixo contributed a lot to this research, as well as some key external collaborators, Dominic Berry, Nathan Weeb, and Juno Lee. Thank you. Thank you.